Good morning, children. I'm Miss B, and this is my classroom. Do you know what today is? That's right. It's Meet a Community Helper Day. And so we have with us a very special guest, everyone's favorite that dang dad. He took an oath to protect and serve his community. That's you. And he's here to tell us all about it. I sure am. And don't worry, kiddos. He is not one of those bad apples you hear about. You know how the saying saying goes. goes, right? One bad apple spoils the bunch. of all, Mr. Uh, Dad, can you tell the class what the police are all about? Of course. The police are here to protect and serve the people. We're the sheepdogs who protect you from the big bad wolves. Does that make us sheep? Well, I suppose so in the sense that we're all sheep in Jesus's flock. Um, I'm not a Christian, though. Well, neither am I, but I'm sure that's just a harmless little metaphor. So who are the wolves? The wolves are the bad guys, the ones who hurt other people, the ones who make it not safe to go out at night. How do you know I'm not a wolf? Oh, don't be silly, dear. Of course you're not. Not yet. Baby hit me on the playground yesterday. Does that make him a wolf? Well, no, I... Do wolves look different than other people? We have this saying you see about wolves wearing sheep's clothing. I mean, sometimes wolves pretend to be sheep so that we can't catch them. I'm sure it's just a coincidence that wolves are often brown or black. And if sheep isn't white, it's defined by its outcast status. Miss? Sorry. Well, don't worry, kiddos. We always catch the bad guys, no matter how hard they try to get away. Actually, according to the FBI statistics, you solved less than half of violent crimes brought before you, and less than a quarter of property crimes. Wait, isn't that really small? What about the rest? Well, I'm sure those numbers aren't right. That must be about people not reporting crimes to the police or something. Um, mister, this Pew Research article says that it's only counting crimes reported to the police which is less than half of all crimes overall. Well, now, it's a difficult job, but it's worth doing no matter how hard it is. And when we catch the bad guys, we put them in prison so you don't ever have to deal with them again. My best friend's cousin's dad went to jail last year for beating up her mom, and he's already out again. And she's been told she'll have to live with him part of the year. Well, that's possible, sweetie, but hopefully he's learned his lesson. What if he didn't? Well, I suppose we'd have to lock him up again for longer this time. Yes, like a timeout. Timeouts don't teach me anything. Timeouts make me cry. Well, don't you want the bad guys to cry? I mean, don't you think we should punish them for doing bad things? Why? What do you mean, why? Well, does punishment accomplish anything my older cousin got sent away for um my mom called it smoking reefer anyway he used to be nice but then he went away and then he came back all mean well it sounds like your cousin was doing drugs i mean drugs change people they turn them into people that they didn't used to be uh my mom is the sweetest person ever and she smokes my brother is mean but he doesn't do any drugs well I take drugs for my ADHD. Does that make me a bad person? Oh, of course not. Not unless you give them to someone else. Or got them without a prescription, even though you need them. Or the cops just decide that something is fishy about them. Miss, I I would never arrest a child. My older sister, she got handcuffed and taken by the school police last year for talking back to a teacher. 
Oh, come on. Those are isolated incidents. No, actually, they're not. Well, the rate of arrest of children under 18 is going down in the U.S., as recently as 2020, the number was still over 424,000, only 0.08 of which was for any kind of violence. Of the percentages specified, the largest portion of arrests of children under the age of 18 was for drug-related crimes, and the second largest was for disorderly conduct. In 2018, over 3,000 of those arrests were children under the age of 10. And that's down every year since 2011. All right. You know what? Yes. I put on a happy face for the kids, but let me tell you how I was trained. The department brought in the guy, like the best guy in the business, and he taught us how to be warriors. We're sheepdogs protecting sheep from all the wolves, all the potential wolves, no matter what you look like. You remember that scene in Men in Black, you know, the first one where they're giving Will Smith some training and he kills that little girl because she shouldn't be out late at night with all those monsters and she's holding books way above her level? I mean, that's what you are. Danger could come from anywhere at any time. Mr. Dad, are you all right? That doesn't sound healthy. It's not healthy, okay, but keeps me alive. It doesn't, though. Uvalde showed us just how much it doesn't. Not because any cops died, because they didn't. But because it showed us just how far cops are willing to go to preserve their own lives over anybody else. That warrior training they go through tells them that they're better than other people. They're worth more than other people. Sheepdogs among the sheep. All those officers. 135 local cops. 150 border patrol agents. And 90 state troopers. And there was only one man brave enough to follow his active shooter training and step forward, only to find himself completely without backup. We think of police as those who protect and serve. But who are they protecting? Who are they serving? Well, of course we have to protect our own lives. Even one officer lost is one too many. Hey, mister, how many kids died in Uvalde? Hey, officer. How many minors died from police violence in the last year? Uh, well, 13, but that doesn't... 13 kids? How many people in the country did y'all kill? Well, about a thousand, I think, but you're not actually- And how many of those people were non-white? This database on the Washington Post has it at about half, if you don't count the ones not identified. Well, of course we have to protect ourselves from where the most crime comes from. So you admit to using racial profiling when deciding how much force to use during an arrest? I, uh... It's a self-reinforcing cycle, you know. The more force you use against minorities, the more you see them as a threat. Which leads to you using more force in minority communities, which leads to more minority arrests and more police brutality against those communities. I thought you said you only arrested bad guys, mister. But they don't. There are no bad guys or good guys. There are only actions that hurt and actions that don't. What do you think hurts people more? Using a counterfeit 20 or slowly and sadistically suffocating a man to death? Now, George Floyd was an isolated incident, okay? You know it wasn't. You know this happens over and over and over. You're trained to think of life, especially black lives, as worth less than property, and there's no getting away from it. Whom do you serve, sheepdog, and what do you protect? Freedom. Whose freedom? Yeah, whose freedom, Mr. Dad? Oh, you know the truth deep down, though. 
You don't serve and protect the public or their freedoms. In 2005, the Supreme Court ruled that you don't even have a duty to do so. So, how about we treat this like one of those crime shows? What is it they always say? Follow the money. That's right, class. So, who funds the Watchmen? Well, it's tax dollars, of course, but it's not really the people who decide where that money goes, is it? It's the politicians. After the George Floyd protests, when cries went up all over the country of defund the police, many state and local governments claimed that they would slash police budgets only to turn around and increase them instead. This has been true since the dawn of time. Pay the army over the local state-sanctioned violence, and you have the power. At least until you stop paying them. And it's very rare for someone to go into politics who doesn't crave power. The police protect the powerful, the wealthy, the donors. Some places, the police go door to door like the roving gangsters they are, knocking over little old ladies, asking for just a small donation with a smile and an implied threat of violence. Hey now, defunding the police would be a disaster. Do you have any idea of how much we take care of so that you don't have to? Crime, sure, but also homeless drifters and drug addicts and crazy people and runaway children and school safety. Oh, do you have the training to handle all that? We learn on the job. So you're not, for instance, licensed social workers or therapists? Teachers, maybe? Well, no. When all you have is violence, everyone looks like a target. Just take the case of Daniel Prude. Prude was a young black man who was having a mental health crisis. He was staying with his brother when, early in the morning, he started behaving extremely erratically, harmed himself, and ran naked into the streets. Prude's brother called emergency services, hoping for help. The cops hooded Prude to keep him from biting, supposedly then knelt on his naked back on the cold street until he asphyxiated. The court ruled his death as being caused by excited delirium, a diagnosis whose main symptoms seem to include resisting arrest. Or worse, let's talk about what happens when the police manage to arrest somebody in mental crisis without killing them. Picture this. You are having the absolute worst moment of your entire life when the cops kick in your door, shout at you, restrain you, toss you in a van, and take you off to a psych ward by kidnapping. According to studies done in 2007, 2011, and 2013, and backed up by innumerable case studies and reports of lived experience. This approach greatly worsens mental health outcomes, and the odds of the worst case scenario go dramatically up. According to the ACLU, nearly 50% of all police brutality victims are disabled, mostly mentally. Why would you want to send in the brute squad what you need is a trained mental health professional. But if they took away police funding, we wouldn't have those guns. We need those guns to keep you safe. There always needs to be a good guy with a gun or the bad guys with guns will win. Didn't you watch Demolition Man? Did you? Did you see how well ordered that city was without police violence? Without the common availability of guns? What about making guns harder to get instead, hmm? 
What about educating people who do get guns for certain pre-approved purposes on how and when to safely use them? Gun violence does not have to be the scourge on this country that it is. Yeah, why are guns so easy to get? Well, it's because of the Second Amendment, you see, in the Constitution. Actually, the Second Amendment protects the rights to have well-ordered militias, which, I mean, already weird, but most people who buy guns aren't part of a militia. Fine, why is it so easy to get guns then, Miss Know-It-All? Honestly? The biggest predictor for gun violence is domestic violence. Torturing animals, bullying, abusing their partners. And the politicians are not going to offend the police by pushing for getting a gun to be illegal if you have domestic violence priors. <laughs> Why would that offend us? Because police are disproportionately likely to be domestic abusers? So, we don't know the complete numbers, of course, because a lot of departments handle little things, like, oh, just a little domestic violence, off the books, in-house. But when we do get data, it suggests that nearly 40% of police homes have had at least one incident. And about a third of those cops keep their jobs even after it's known. Mr. Dad, you wouldn't hit your kid, would you? No, I, I would never. Oh yeah? And what about your colleagues? Your fellow cops? Would they ever? Well, I, I mean, I, I, I can't say, I mean... Can't or won't? I mean, I'm, I might have known a guy who, I mean, kind of like, maybe... What could possibly make that okay? Well, he, he was a good guy, you know? I mean, it, it was an accident. It was a one-time thing, and if I'd have reported him, they would have locked him up, and then his family would have been in real trouble, and... And? And I would have lost all the respect of my peers. I mean, you don't snitch. Because you are the law? I thought we were using Demolition Man, not Judge Dredd. Fine. Let's return to Demolition Man. Tell me, what happens in the prisons in Demolition Man? Ooh, ooh, I know. I know. Your parents let you watch Demolition Man? Aw, mine said it was too violent for me. The prison was a nice, clean place where people went to sleep and had nice dreams so that they'll come back out rehabilitated. Very good. Now, do any of you know what prisons are like in real life? Scary. Prisons are work camps for undesirables. What? No, they aren't. So, tell me what happens in prison, then. Well, the bad guys go in. They serve their time, and then they get out. So, do they, like, sleep in there? Like in the movie? Well, no. Do they take classes, then? I mean, sometimes, I guess, if there's, like, a prison initiative or something. So, what do they do all day? For most prisoners, they wake up early and go to work. And then they have lunch and go to work. And then they have an early dinner and... Maybe they can spend the evening watching TV or playing very simple games. Sometimes, in the morning or possibly the afternoon, they might take a class. Or go exercise in the yard. Or sit quietly in their cells. But then again, that's just for low security prisons. There are also high security wards, where much less is allowed and solitary confinement, a practice far too common at all levels of security, which has been known to cause severe mental health problems even in a very short time. But miss, didn't you say work? How can you be working when inside a prison? Nearly two in three incarcerated people in the US work behind bars. 
many face retaliation from their guards if they refuse to labor. Well, sure, some prisoners do work, but they get paid for it. Oh, sure. Pennies on the hour, because minimum wage doesn't apply. And even if it did, the prisons withhold up to 80% of the paycheck for room, board, and maintenance. Well, surely you don't think people in prison for criminal action just get to live in government buildings for free. Free? When our tax dollars pay for them to live in privately owned and operated prisons? Free when they live in abject squalor and are forced into slavery? Ooh, ooh, Miss, Miss B, Miss B, what does squalor mean? Squalor, in this case, refers to cramped windowless rooms with a lack of fresh air and sunlight, unhealthy food, and a lack of health care. Even if it's icky, won't they come out eventually? Imagine a classroom you weren't allowed to leave, not for years and years, not even for recess. Oh, no! And the teacher is very, very mean. Not only is she strict, she punishes you for things you didn't even do. That's not fair. And then, if you ever get out, she has somebody follow you around and watch what you do, so that if you break even the tiniest little rule, even one that's normally allowed outside of school, they bring you back. Even at home? What about my parents? Good point. Imagine then that your parents either can't do anything about it, or they agree with her, and nothing you do will ever be good enough again. Miss, I'm scared. A prisoner's external life, their civil or social existence, one might say, is often effectively over the moment they're incarcerated. The prison guards are routinely abusive in more ways than just extracting capital from their labor. But that's not all. Even if they ever are set free. They often get out to find themselves completely at a loss for support or community. And at best, they're now excluded from large portions of participation in society. Most jobs refuse to hire anybody with prior convictions, and they are legally allowed to ask. So there's no reliable source of work for freed people. Their probation officers hound them, looking for reasons to put them away, but as they grow poorer without jobs or social support, they often have to turn to illegal work or theft. Anyone with a felony conviction is no longer allowed to vote, which effectively disenfranchises them from the entirety of civic life, too. Although, of course, they do still count in the census against representation. While there have been some efforts to re-enfranchise these voters, People trying to exercise that right seem oddly frequently to wind up being arrested. Hmm. And so back into the prisons they go, as soon as a reason can be found or manufactured. And the more time a person spends incarcerated, the more likely they are to wind up there again. I mean, yeah, prison recidivism rates are high, but that's because people really are terrible. I mean, what kind of horrible person gets poor kids hooked on drugs and goes to jail for it and then comes out not having learned their lesson? Yeah, didn't you say they could take classes? Doesn't that help? Sometimes it helps, but it's not enough. Prisons are places of slavery and punishment, not of rehabilitation. What classes the prisoners can access are generally run by people completely outside the prison system, and usually with little to no help from the government. So wait, you mean prisons don't help people even a little bit? That's right. 
well, what would you do about all the criminals then if you didn't have prisons? If you took all the money away from the police, who would you call if you were assaulted or if someone stole from you? There it is. That question that people think is such a gotcha. What would we do without prisons, without police? But it's only because you never listen past the slogans. You don't want us to have plans because then you'd have to admit that the status quo isn't permanent. It hasn't always been this way, and it doesn't have to be. If people understood the lies that they've been fed about the carceral state, it wouldn't have a chance. Let's get one terminology thing straight first. Defund the police does not mean abolish the police. Defunding the police means to pare down their budget, take away their fancy military toys, make them a much smaller and more targeted organization that deals specifically with violent crime. Use the rest of that money to fund social services to deal more appropriately with other issues. But me? I want to abolish the police. I think that the entire institution is rotten from top to bottom, and we don't need it. And sure, I will settle for half measures for incremental change while we build the structures for the real necessary change. But my end goal, personally, I think that the institution of policing and of the carceral state down to prisons just needs to die. Now, I know that may sound a bit extreme, but... Chaos! Uh, criminals everywhere! Murder without repercussions! Might would make right! Aren't you just describing the police? What? Were you listening when I told you how few of the cases that even get reported to police the police actually solve? How many of the police are domestic abusers? Let me make this totally clear for you. At any given time, the police are the single biggest unchecked group breaking the law. Their state-sanctioned violence means that their might makes right in most cases. They have no legal obligation and clearly little desire to protect and serve the people. They protect and serve themselves and their cash cows. Cops lie all the time. They lie about who they are, what they're doing, and what the law is. But they also lie in court. Cops perjure themselves so often that districts are required to keep something called a Brady List, which is just a list of officers still employed by them who have been known to perjure or otherwise make unreliable testimony in court. The Brady Lists are public record. Look them up yourself. And then there's theft. Uh, pardon, I mean civil asset forfeiture. That's what it's called when the cops just straight up take something that isn't theirs. More property was stolen via civil asset forfeiture in 2014 than was stolen the normal way by burglars and such. And it probably has been like that every year since, since the rate of civil asset forfeiture has not gone down. They can take almost anything they want this way, and there's basically nothing you can do about it. Illegal traffic stop where they didn't even have a ticket to give you? They could still take all the cash out of your wallet and call it civil asset forfeiture. And there's violence, of course. Police kill around 10,000 dogs every year, most of whom are absolutely no threat. And don't get me started on what they do to humans. They kill and injure so many people 
that the entire country can rise up and protest multiple times without making a dent in the practice. Oh, come on. That's not every cop. But every cop knows about it. And every cop condones it. Or at least doesn't report it. You admitted as much earlier, didn't you, when you told me about that colleague who assaulted a family member? I live in a low-crime area, in a low-crime state. And just in my personal experience, I have been harassed by cops. I have had my concerns dismissed by cops. I have seen cops kneel on the back of a screaming black man just for inhabiting a space. I've had friends pulled over for no reason, and worse, I've had a friend stalked and harassed by a cop and his cop buddies. Sure, not every cop does this, but every cop sits by and lets it happen. Because you don't rat on your friends, your colleagues, your superiors. At least you don't, and keep your job. Okay, that, I mean, well, okay. I mean, when you put it that way, yes, it kind of does sound like we might be the baddies. Very good. Okay, so what answers do you have? When you strip away the guns and the military armor, when you take away the officers and you tear down the prisons, how do you deal with crime, with the mentally disturbed, with the homeless? If you want to deal with a problem this big, you have to look at why it exists. You can't just slap a band-aid over an open wound and hope it'll heal. If you want to prevent crime, you need to look at the causes of crime, not the effects. Uh, but Miss B, what causes crime? I thought it was bad people. Oh honey, people aren't all bad or all good. You remember when BB got put in timeout for yelling in class? I sure do. Yes. But isn't BB your friend? Yes. So, BB, do you remember what we talked about at the end of your timeout? You asked me why I was yelling, and I said it's because I got angry. And you asked me why I got angry, and I said it's because learning about how bad things were in the past bothered me, and you said. Sometimes we all get angry. And sometimes that anger is even fair and just. But that doesn't give us an excuse to be mean to other people, especially when they aren't the ones we're mad at. You gave me a pillow to yell into when I'm upset, and it felt good. Now I don't yell at other people anymore. Exactly. So, if people aren't bad, they just make mistakes, then how do we keep them from making big mistakes that hurt people? I'd actually really like to know the answer to that. Have you ever honestly asked anybody that you arrested for an offense why they did what they did? No, never mind, I don't want to know. People like to individualize crime, and sure, every case is going to be different and have different factors, but there is a systematic cause here. The roots of crime lie in inequity. First of all, we have to recognize that wrong and illegal are not and possibly cannot be the same thing. It is wrong for the police to steal via civil asset forfeiture, but it is legal. and. It's illegal to collect seaweed off of New Hampshire public beaches at night, but who cares? That's not wrong, it's just on the books. So what do we even mean when we talk about crime? What's worth going after? Well, even anarchists believe in personal property. That's not private property. Private property is something else, but that's another video. So let's talk about theft. Why do people steal? Greed? Okay, so let's hypothetically say that somebody is stealing for greed. But greedy people amass money and power to themselves, and so you're probably talking then about somebody who already has quite a bit. Do you think they're really going to get arrested? Or get convicted if they do? 
Or stay in prison if they get convicted? No. The money and power that they've amassed places them outside of the repercussions of the law. So that's not really an answer. And I know you're not talking about the single biggest category of theft, which is wage theft, wherein an employer denies an employee proper wages due to one of various schemes like unpaid overtime or crunch. I've yet to see anybody go to jail over that. So when we talk about property crime or theft, we're really talking about the petty stuff, like, you know, stealing a bicycle wheel. Do you imagine most people go to the trouble of ripping off a bicycle wheel or taking a package off a porch for greed? Why else? Poverty. Necessity. Do you know how much money there is to be made in petty theft? I mean, granted, on the scale of, say, wage theft, it's not much. But when you're on the brink of starvation, when you have too many mouths to feed, when everyone in your neighborhood is in the same boat, when there is no work to be had, well, you do what you have to do. So what? Eliminate poverty? Yes. Attack the root cause. Eliminate poverty. And I guess this is your solution for homeless bums then, too? Yes. It's an impossible dream. I don't want my money going to layabouts and beggars and thieves. I want people to earn their way in life, like I had to do. Why? What? Why should anyone have to earn being alive? Why should people have to starve when we make more than enough food for everyone worldwide? Why should anyone go homeless when we have double, maybe triple, the number of houses that we would need to give everybody a roof? Why would we deny anyone life, liberty, or the pursuit of happiness just because they don't have property? But that's not fair. I had to work for what I have. <laughs> Even if that were true, and I have my reservations there, Officer Dad, why should you have had to suffer? Why should your child have to suffer in their turn? Don't you want a better world for them? Let's get to practical data. Even before we look at communist societies that are doing just fine, like Vietnam, let's look at universal basic income and universal housing experiments here at home in the West. Stanford's Basic Income Lab did a meta-analysis, a study of studies, of universal basic income experiments across the US, Canada, and other nations considered by the Institute to be similar. The conclusion? Well, they lack the long-term data because nobody has tried it for a decade or more, but in the short term, people were lifted out of poverty, health and education outcomes were extremely increased, and productivity was not decreased. As for housing, you already spend more on arresting, jailing, and giving emergency health services to unhoused people than you would to literally just put them in empty homes. But better than that, places from Houston to Salt Lake City have successful reintegration programs that are based in community. They give them houses and training and social services, and it still costs less and is better outcome for everyone than anything starting with an arrest. Well, most of them are mentally ill substance abusers. They'll be back out on the street in no time if they aren't already. Actually, in those cases, it's already been years. The data is in. Most homeless people there are temporarily unhoused whether it's queer youth who have been kicked out of their family home, 
or domestic violence survivors fleeing a situation. And those people are generally taken up very quickly by targeted programs, even in places where little else has changed. But you're right. Many chronically unhoused people are mentally unwell, whether from neurological conditions or from drug addiction, which is an illness, not a vice. But why should those people go without care? Wouldn't you want there to be somebody to help? A friend who went through a serious bout of suicidal depression? Or a child who was slipped LSD and had a psychotic break? What good does it do anyone to let those people suffer and die alone on the street? So what do we do with them? This is where the money goes. The money that we used to spend on letting the police arm themselves like an invading force. It goes here, to the infrastructure, to take care of people. On housing for the unhomed, on mental facilities for the unwell and the addicted, on training therapists and social workers and teachers, rehabilitation programs that integrate into the community. And we don't need police for that. All police would do is get in the way. Fine, fine, but what about the violent crimes? Okay. Tell me. How many sexual assault victims do you know of that came out of the system feeling better or vindicated or at least soothed by their treatment at the hands of law enforcement? I... I don't know. It... Wasn't very many, was it? I mean, I guess not, but if they just report it. What, like your coworker's wife? Oh, I mean, okay, I guess not everyone has that option. The world is not like Law & Order SVU. Let's talk about an example that, uh, that you'll have heard of. Celebrity case that has impacted my life, even though I barely care who these people are. Oh my god, not the Amber Heard Johnny Depp thing again. Oh yes. To give a very, very short summary, Johnny Depp was accused of abusing Amber Heard, his one-time partner. He was already judged in the UK by the courts to be in the wrong. But Due to a technicality, he was allowed to bring a second suit in the U.S. During the proceedings, he allegedly manipulated evidence, forced the entire proceedings to be public, and cultivated popular support by making a forest of Twitter bots to support him online. The result being that popular opinion, and eventually the jury's decision, viewed him with extreme sympathy and viewed her with scrutiny and disdain, calling her phony and a liar. And you know what every survivor I know felt when they saw that? Unsafe. We, and I do mean we, don't report because we know we won't be believed. We know that the cops won't believe us even if they do show up. And if on some off chance things go to court, we'll simply be re-traumatized and re-stigmatized by the court of public opinion. And then of course there's those domestic violence stats among cops that I already mentioned. You? I'm... I'm so sorry. I... I mean, truly, I wish I could have helped you. My experience is commonplace. I had the money and support that I needed to get the help that I wanted, but most people don't. And you will never hear about it, because you're not safe to talk to. So what can we do? 
Well, for a start, we could take some of that money that the cops are currently using for SWAT gear and riot shields and give it to domestic violence centers and training therapists. But on a more systemic level, let's talk about why people assault others, sexually or otherwise. Sadism? Anger? Anyone can feel those things. It's what you do with your feelings that matters. Right. What we need is outreach, education, reparations. Assault is born of anger, of power, of hatred. But those things don't exist in a vacuum. People learn to hate. People learn to take their anger out on others. It's not an accident, and it's got to be addressed in the open, or it will win out every time. Our education system is criminally and intentionally underfunded. Our teachers are overworked and underpaid. Bias is baked into the way that money is distributed among districts and schools, and let's face it, it's not an accident that the poorest neighborhoods have the worst schools with the worst funding, the worst outcomes, and that they happen to be in Black and other minority communities. Do you realize, I mean, you and I are in our 30s. We've grown up in a world where desegregation was the expectation. But our parents grew up with Jim Crow. And their parents probably grew up in a world where women didn't have the right to own a credit card. The past is not some alien place. It is close, close, close behind us, nipping at our heels and driving our path into the future. You can't change history, but you can work and acknowledge what it's doing today. You can't go back and free those slaves brought over from Africa. But you can prevent their descendants from being incarcerated today. You can't return the lives of six million Jews, but you can acknowledge the rise of fascism in the modern age and recognize those dog whistles that haven't changed in a hundred years. You can't prevent what happened to me. But you can work to undo toxic masculinity where it grows. Do you think, do you think I'm not angry? Do you seriously think I'm not angry all the time? Do you imagine this sweetness and light is my nature and not a deliberate choice? I choose to use my anger to teach, to help. To speak out. I choose to use my anger to raise a new generation on better ideals than the ones I was given. I use my anger to protect, not to harm. What do you do with your anger, officer? When someone does commit an assault, the best thing to do is rehabilitative justice, not retributive public circus. Make some kind of reparation and go into a rehabilitation program that benefits the community. The people who were harmed don't ever need to forgive, but the people who do harm could be rehabilitated. If they acknowledge the harm they did, work to balance it out, and never do it again, learn better, they could go on to be meaningful, productive, happy citizens of a community. They could still live their lives. All of them. Yeah, but what if they can't? I mean, even you have to admit you can't save everyone. 
It's sad, but true. Sometimes can't be helped. But do you really think that locking somebody up in a musty room away from everyone for the rest of their lives is the right call? What good does it really do? So what then? Honestly, I'm not an expert on this particular point. But there are people who are, and you can seek them out and read their work. But I can give you an example. Imagine, if you will, a country with no prisons and no need for them. Sound fake? No, it's actually the Netherlands. They haven't had prisons since 2018, and since 2013 they only had about 20 people in them anyway. They've been managing for years now with community-based programs and monitoring. They're doing just fine. I promise you, it is possible to live in a country that doesn't have the highest incarceration rate in the world, institutionalized slavery, and brutal assaults nearly daily by the people we think are supposed to protect us. That's right. Abolish the police and build something better in their place. It's not only possible, it's necessary. And you can trust me, I used to be one of them. Class dismissed. Keep learning, friends. Asked me why I was yelling, and I already forget the lines. F my life. Bit of Do wolves look different than people? How do you know I'm not a wolf? Grr. Why am I really struggling with this? <laughs> Killian, what are you doing? Oh no! Oh fuck. I... <laughs> Helps if you actually remember the lines, you know? Follow the money. Where's my next line? Where's my next line? I forgot how long the script is. No offense. How do you know I'm not a wolf? Finding all my lines. Hopefully this isn't obnoxious. And if it is, I'm sorry. Oh. How do you know I'm not a wolf? Yeah, who's freedom, Mr. Dad? If that's your real name. Oh no! Kill in this country last. <laughs> no! I know! I know! I know! I know! I know! Ooh. Ow, that hurt. <coughs> <coughs>